good morning and welcome back to Tech Focus 3. We are absolutely delighted to have you here this morning. And this is the, this is the bit of the workshop that we're most excited about because this is where you get to roll your sleeves up and have a go. Um, so hopefully by the end of the morning, you'd have made a software-based artwork, your Git will be revealed, and you'd have made a disk image. So, yes, of course. Can you hear me now? Okay, sorry. Um, so this morning, it's going to start. We're going to have um, Ben. Oops, Ben will talk for ten minutes about the command line, and then Dina and Mark will jump between their various presentations, and then we will have a coffee break at eleven. On each table, there is. What do, we have tech support. We have teaching assistants at each of the tables on the stage. So if you get stuck, put your, your arm up or grab them and they will give you a hand. And we also have um, teaching assistants in the front two rows down in the main part of the auditorium. So please do take advantage of them. Um, I'm just gonna remind you that the restrooms are at the back on the right up the stairs. Um, and because we have quite a lot to get through this morning, if you have a technical issue, raise your hand. If you have a more sort of conceptual, philosophical question, we'd be very grateful if you could write it down and save it till the end of the session, just because we've got so much to get through. But we do really want to hear your questions at the end of the session. Um, if your machine at any point asks for a password, the password is password. Um, and if you get lost, don't worry, just listen and follow the instructors so you just get a sense of what's going on. Because actually, you can go home and you can do it yourself. Everything is on the USB that you downloaded. There's all the instructions there. So you can also do this at your leisure at another time. But I'm sure you will all follow and there won't be any problems. Um, Mark Heller and Ben Fino Radin were introduced to you yesterday. So this morning, I'm going to introduce our third speaker, Dina Ingle. Dina Engel is a clinical professor as well as the Associate Director of Undergraduate Studies for the Computer Science Minors Program in the Department of Computer Science at the Courant Institute of Mathematical Sciences of New York University. She teaches undergraduate, sorry my screen's just gone to sleep. She teaches undergraduate computer science courses on web and database technologies, as well as courses for undergraduate and graduate students in the digital humanities and the arts. And she also supervises graduate and undergraduate students' research projects in the digi digital humanities and the arts. Prior to returning to academia, she ran a systems group in an international auction house for nine years. She knows a lot about art as well. Um, over the last six years, she has conducted collaborative research on the conservation of software-based art with conservators both at the Museum of Modern Art and here at the Solomon Guggenheim Museum in New York City. So we're going to start with Ben. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. So you should give yourselves a big pat on the back for being here. Um, you know, this is going to be a very technical, very hands-on workshop. And some of the things that we're going to be going over are things that maybe have scared you in the past. Um, and that's totally legitimate. But so a lot of what we're going to be doing today is looking at um, really how these tools really work at a basic level so you just feel more comfortable with them. Um, so. I'm going to be doing the introduction to the command line. And you may be asking yourself, what is the command line? Um, well, you may think of the command line and think of something like this. You know, you've probably seen it in movies, you know, where there's some kind of hacker tapping away and there's bright colors and, you know, a text in interface and then they go, I'm in. <laughs> or they say, enhance, and it does something cool. Um, the command line really is just a text-based way of working with your computer. So it's a way of giving direct instructions 
to the thing that's sitting in front of you. So when you are interacting with your computer through the graphical user interface, in other words, your desktop, clicking the close button, things like that, that's sending instructions. So there's a layer of abstraction allowing you to interact with the computer in a visual way. The command line is sort of taking a step back and going a bit backwards in history to a more direct way of interfacing with it. Oop, touchy connection here. Um, so why learn the command line? That It sounds really hard and really boring and why can't we just use a graphical user interface? Um, the fact is that a lot of the tools we're gonna be looking at today in the command line are actually quite old. And that's a good thing because it means they've been around for a long time and they'll be around for a long time into the future. So the command line is a bit more stable in terms of um, obsolescence because um, it's you're not reliant on the whims of let's say Apple or you know a major corporation like Microsoft. A lot of the tools in the command line are coming more from the open source community and the developer community, and they're things that are kind of really low level. So if you learn how to use a tool that's in the command line, chances are it will be around for quite a while. And as well, uh, the command line allows you to uh, be a bit more flexible and get things to talk to one another. So I see a lot of you have Macs. Macs are based on a system called Unix. Unix was an operating system invented at Bell Labs and it was command line based. So it looked a lot like the command line we're gonna be working in today. And a fundamental concept of Unix is that you can take the output from one program and then input it into another program just because you've decided that's a cool idea and maybe you can do, you know, it's like you can hack two things together and do some new result that wasn't possible before. You're doing something that no tool off the shelf can allow you to do. That's something, of course, that you can't do with software with a graphical user interface. When you're interacting with software through a graphical user interface, you are dependent on what the designers have decided you should be allowed to do, whereas with a Unix-based system, such as Linux, which you're all running in your virtual machines, or the command line in, or terminal in OS X, you are a bit more flexible in terms of things you can kind of cobble together and patch together to do different things that maybe somebody else hasn't thought of or didn't think that you should be allowed to do. So it's a bit more power. It puts you really in the driver's seat of your computer. So um, what you have in front of you is a Linux desktop and uh, we're gonna just jump right into some of the basics in the command line. So the, on the left-hand side here, you have what's called your application launcher. And to get to your terminal, you just click this little black square with the uh, caret character. And if you're not in full screen mode on your virtual machine and you would like to be, uh, you can go up to the, and if you're on a Mac, uh, you can go to the view menu here, and this is in the instructions as well, and then click full screen mode. If you're on Windows, uh, you'll find a menu sort of down at the bottom. If you mouse down to the bottom and stay there, it should show up and you'll see the view menu. So I'm gonna go into full screen mode in my virtual machine first because it's a bit less distracting to have like the Mac interface and the Linux interface. So I'm gonna click the terminal, and then I get this. So this is what you call your shell. This is where you work in the command line. So a few things here. Um, so we see some text. What is this? So this is our username, techfocus, at techfocus virtual box. So that's the name of this computer. So it's saying in the command prompt, which is what we call this when it's sort of flashing and there's a, a cursor and it's waiting instructions, we call it a command prompt. Um, so it's basically saying this is your user and this is uh, the computer that we are on. And this dollar sign is something that you will see actually in your instructions. The dollar sign is the symbol that represents the command prompt. So when you see that dollar sign and this uh, little rectangle there, that means it's ready to accept some instructions. So this is where you do your typing. 
So it, in instructions, not only in the ones that we've provided, but in the future, if this is something that you're using in your practice as a conservator, you'll often see the dollar sign before a command. That's not something you type, that's just a convention used to indicate that this is a command that goes into the command prompt. The dollar sign is sort of a um, convention used to indicate that. So the, the first thing, the first real concept to introduce with the command line is the idea of position. So in the command line, you're always at a certain position in your file system. So a file system is no different than you know, Windows Explorer or the Finder on a Mac. It's just a system of folders and files. But when you work in the command line, you always have a position somewhere in your computer's f system of folders. So what does that mean? Well, let's see where we are right now. In order to find out where our position is, we type the letters P, W, D, which stands for print working directory. And then we hit enter. So what we see, the output of the PWD program is slash home slash tech focus. So that's the folder we're quote unquote in right now. So just jumping back over to the slides really quick. So the next command, uh, let's say we wanted to see, okay, what's inside of this folder. We can type the letters L and S and hit enter. So LS is short for list. So when we type LS, it lists the contents of the folder that we're currently inside of. So we saw by typing PWD that we're currently in the slash home slash tech focus folder. So that's not, you know, this listing here isn't very useful. You know, it's just giving us the names of things. We don't know what's a directory or what's a file. We don't know their file sizes. So in order to get kind of a different way of, of seeing this information, we're gonna type the LS program again, but instead of hitting enter, we're gonna put a space in, and then dash L. So this is what you call a flag. When you are working in the command line, programs, and a program meaning these commands that we're typing in, PWD, LS, these are all programs, a flag is basically an option. So by specifying this dash L, we're saying we want LS to work in long mode. So we want more information. So if I hit enter now, we see we get more detailed information. So this is going to look like total cryptic Greek to most of you. So what does this actually mean? So each line is a file or folder. So the way we can tell whether something is a folder or a file is this first character here. So you see this D, R, W, X, R, and so on. The letter D indicates that this entry is a directory. So if there's a dash, that means this is a file. So we can get some more information here. Um, this, the next part that comes after the D or the dash is the um, permissions on the directory or file. So the way that permissions work is it indicates um, whether people can read, write, or execute the file or folder. Uh, we won't go into the real in-depth specifics of that. It's not really critical for today, but that's just what that is. And uh, then it indicates what user owns that file or folder. So in this case, the tech focus user owns this folder. But what is this 4096? That's pretty cryptic. What, what is that? That's actually the file size. Um, but it's currently displaying it in bytes. So let's say we had a 50 gigabyte file. It wouldn't display 50 gigabytes. It would display however many bytes that is. That's not very useful. So now you'll, you'll see that my command prompt is kind of full. Uh, I want to continue uh, with the workshop, but you know, you can't really see it now. So what I'm going to do is type clear, C-L-E-A-R, and hit enter, and it does what you might imagine. It just clears out the command prompt. 
So I want to run the list program again, but I want the file sizes to be more readable, something that I understand. So the first trick, and this is a, a really useful one, uh, and it's important to note, programmers and coders are totally lazy. So there are tons and tons of shortcuts that you can use. They've kind of been designed by programmers over the years because we're so lazy. So if you hit the up arrow, you'll see that you kind of have a history of all of the commands that we've done. So if I hit the up arrow twice, I get back my ls dash l. And if you find, if you're scrolling through the history of your commands and you've gone too far, which I can see some of you doing right now, <laughs> um, just hit, hit the control button, press and hold the control button, and then the letter C. That's called a keyboard interrupt, and all it does is it clears out whatever is in your command prompt and gives you a new line. <laughs> so we have our ls-l, so what do we add to make it more readable? The letter H, and that stands for human. <laughs> so we don't want this to be just machine readable, we want it to be human readable. So you'll see that I just added the letter H right onto the end. No space, not another dash, just right after the L. So if I hit enter now, you can see that the file sizes are listed in a more human readable unit. Um, we don't really have anything that interesting in this directory. They're all just uh, folders, and folders are very, very, very small, so they're all just four kilobytes, but you get the idea. Um, so let's say we wanted to change directories. We wanted to move to a new position. You know, we're currently listing the contents of, as we saw, home slash tech focus. But what if we want to see what's inside of our desktop? which is a directory inside of the directory we are currently working in. Well, the command is cd, or change directory. So the way the command works is you type cd, space, and then you have to specify what directory you want to change to. So if we want to change to the desktop, I can just type the word desktop, and again, when you are working in the command line, it's always relative to your current position. So the reason I can just type the word desktop in is because I'm currently in a folder where the folder desktop is just right inside of that folder. If I was outside of this folder and somewhere else, I would need to type the full path to get to the desktop, which, because we're, we can see that we're inside of home slash tech focus, the full path would be slash home slash tech focus. And it, it's at this point that I want to show you another shortcut. So you'll see I've just typed the word tech. I haven't finished typing focus. And again, because I'm lazy, I don't want to type the whole word myself. Uh, so I want the computer to do it for me. So I'm just going to hit the tab key. So tab in the command line is for auto-completion. So that means if you've started typing something, in this case, a directory path, and you're not, let's say you're not really sure about the spelling, well you could start typing it and hit tab, and if you've spelled it correctly, and there's only one possible uh, option that is, you know, start, that is spelled that way, it will finish it for you. So now I'm going to type desktop, and it, you'll see that I'm typing it with a capital D, because it had a capital D when we listed the uh, directory. So the command line is always case sensitive. It's very, very important. Um, for example, if I were to type desktop with a lowercase d, it will say no such file or directory. Um, so I'm going to just clear really quick so you can see. So if we do this again, and you'll also notice that if I don't have the correct capitalization, and I hit tab, it won't autocomplete. So the autocomplete's not just a cool trick for being lazy, it's also a cool trick to be accurate. Because if I do tab and it doesn't work, I know it doesn't exist. So, I just type desktop. So let's see what's inside of the desktop. Oh, a bunch of stuff. So let's do ls space dash lh for long human readable. And you can see 
it looks a little weird on the screen because the font is so big, so the lines are kind of breaking. Um, but we can see there's some PDFs, um, there's a text file, there's some directories, and then we can see the different file sizes here. So the next command we're gonna do, and I think this is, uh, yeah, because we're probably running short on time, this'll be our last one, yeah. Um, so we're gonna learn how to make a directory. So the command for making a directory is mkdir. So that's an abbreviation, obviously. It's short for make directory. Um, so make directory only has one option, and the option is the name of what you want the directory to be called. So let's make a directory called my art. So capital M, Y, capital A, art. And you don't get any response. So that's pretty standard. You'll, know, you'll notice throughout the day that a lot of the tools that we're using in the command line don't really tell you when they've finished doing something or if it's worked. Uh, they just kind of do stuff. Um, they're a bit... Uh, obtuse. So, but we can find, of course, if that directory exists now by listing the directory that we are currently in. Uh, so we'll do ls, uh, and let's not even do, do long view, let's just list. And there we see, we have the my art directory. So this is a really brief introduction to the command line, but the core concepts here are uh, location. So remember, you're always working from a position. So if you can't find a file or folder, uh, and you know that it does exist, you're probably not doing the full file path, and it might not be in the directory you're currently working in. And then uh, just the concept of options and flags that you can pass to programs. Um, oh, and lastly, just one last one. If you want to learn more about a command, um, you can basically, before you type the command, add the word man, and that's short for manual, not like man as in dude. Um, so let's say we want to see more about the uh, make directory command, um, which is a pretty basic one, so this doesn't, isn't a good example, but let's say man space mkdir and hit enter. So this is the manual for the make directory command. So all standard commands that we'll be using today, for the most part, uh, have manuals, um, and they typically will give you an example of the syntax, how it's used, and then uh, the up and down arrow keys will show you a whole listing of all of the really, really detailed options. Um, and then to exit, just press the Q button. Okay, now I'm gonna hand it over to Dina, and uh, you guys will begin making your digital works of art. Hey, can you hear me? Are we good? Okay. So I would like to introduce you to processing, which is software that was developed specifically for visual artists. And I want to start with a quote by Martin Wattenberg. We heard about some of his works yesterday. Software is the best way I have found to express myself. When I work in other media, the results somehow seem worse in reality than in my head. The software I create, however, has a magical quality. It ends up being better than what I originally imagined. So over the next part of this workshop when we work in processing, if you love watercolors, if you love oil paints, if you like pastels, if you like to sculpt, think about this as a new medium that we are introducing you to. I'd also like to switch gears for a moment and briefly introduce a concept that is, um, <laughs> there's a school of thought that basically says that artists see or imagine and capture and have over time 
most or many of the main innovations in mathematics and the sciences. So there are many examples one can cite. Um, the most commonly cited example is um, perspective, which the Italian Renaissance artists figured out a good hundred years before the mathematicians could wrap their minds around it. And I would like to talk just briefly about pointillism and, post and um, the post-impressionist period. Because in pointillism, when you think about a painting like the Grand Jatte, when you're in Chicago and you stand very close to this painting, what you see are dots, fairly organized dots. As you step away, the colors of the dots will blend so that what our eye perceives is shape. And this is, you can see this, I've magnified this image so that you can see the dots. And in fact, if we knew where every single dot were located on, the, on a pointillist canvas, and we know its color, we can reconstruct that image. So I think those artists understood long before the engineers how to build a screen. All of your monitors are pixels in a grid. This is from the same image you just saw, but here it is pixelated. And the same thing applies when we are working with art that is displayed on a monitor. It is a series of dots that from the distance we look at it will blend and our eye will see the shapes and will see the designs. So the concept is that if you imagine a grid where you know the location of every point or pixel or dot, however you want to imagine it. If you know the location and the color of every dot on your grid, you have an image. And we can create an image. In processing, by convention, we look at the upper left-hand corner of any image and we call that, we address that as zero, zero. We say that it's zero, zero. As you move to the right, the numbers go up. That's the horizontal axis. And as you move down, the numbers also increase, and we call that the y-axis. So if we know the x-coordinate, the y-coordinate, and the color of every pixel that is in the frame of the image you're working in, we can build a picture. So if you open processing by going to this icon on your left, it'll... Show the frame. Ah, on the upper left-hand corner, there is a red X. And in fact, in processing, each file is referred to as a sketch. So just a little bit of background that processing was, has also been widely used to teach programming skills. The version of processing we are using today is based on the programming language of Java. There are also processing versions available in languages such as Python and JavaScript. My goal today is for you to experience a little bit of processing as an artist, that for you to feel what it is to be a digital artist by working in this environment. And, um, we have teaching assistance, and also I will be happy to take questions during breaks and so forth. So let's start by drawing a line. The first thing I would do if I picked up a brush or a new pen, anytime I take, pick up a new watercolor brush, the first thing I do is I want to see what, how does it handle when I draw a line. Well, processing offers us what is called a function, called line, and it takes what are called 
parameters, four parameters or four arguments, we have four numbers. The first two numbers refer to the x position and the y position, in other words, how far out and how far down for the first point on the line, and the second two refer to the ending point of the line. So if I come back to processing and I say line 0, 0, 200, 200, close the paren, and Java, and in processing, and this is part of Java, requires semicolons. Semicolons in Java are like a period in English. When you type this and hit play, you draw a line. Okay. So here we have a line from the upper left-hand corner where the coordinates are 0, 0, and going down to a position 200 pixels across and 200 pixels down, so we have a diagonal line. I, I, I see some cheers, so I'm, I think there are some lines. So let's look at some more functions that would be useful. So now we have a line. What if we were to change the background color? Zero represents black. It represents the absence of color. We'll talk about color in a little bit in a moment. Stroke represents the color of the line. So now what happens? when I run my sketch is we now have a white line on a black background as we have defined a new design, a new drawing. Yes? Uh, you can if you want to. You don't have to stop your previous sketches. I am doing it so that I don't clutter up the screen for you. If you want to stop a previous sketch, you can do it here. You can close out this sketch. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about some of the other things that you will want to add. Color is very important. I just want to talk about color very briefly so you get a sense. For today's work, we are working in the color space called RGB, red, green, and blue. It's as though red, green, and blue are the primary colors, whereas if we were working with watercolors or oils, we would consider red, yellow, and blue to be our primary colors. In the way we are working today, each of the components of a given color consists of any a measure of 0 to 255 for each red, green, and blue. The significance of the 255 is that 0 to 255 is actually 256 options. This reflects the fact that we are in the computer world. 256 is a power of 2. So you'll see lots of things where we are working with powers of 2. Black can be expressed as 0. White can be expressed as 255 the maximum on all colors mixed together. Let's look at how we might build a circle. And what I'm doing is these are all available to you on your drive. I'm opening them just so you don't have to watch me type. <laughs> but let's step through it. 
So I've set the size of my drawing here to be 400 pixels wide and 400 pixels high. I've set it to have a white background. I've set it so that stroke refers, think of like a pen stroke, that lines that I draw and outlines will be in black. I've set it so that for the moment, if I fill a shape, it would have equal parts of red and blue and no green. So we should get something in the magenta purple range. And I've introduced a new shape, an ellipse. So if you think about a circle geometrically, if we know the center point of a circle and we know the radius, we can draw a circle. Processing offers a function called an ellipse in which the first two numbers are the center point and the next two numbers are the height and the width. If you have an ellipse where the height and the width are identical, we then have a circle. And if I click play, we do. We have a circle that is in the middle of the drawing because I established its center point, 200 across and 200 down. It has a, as we thought, it has a magenta-ish, purplish color. Mine looks a little different. And it's in the middle. And we have a line that is going from the upper left corner to the lower right corner. I would like to introduce, at this point, the concept of annotating code. One of the ways to annotate code in processing is with a double slash. Any line that begins with a double slash will not be executed. And any line that contains a double slash means that everything after the double slash will also not be executed. So this is a way of differentiating what is intended for human readership and what the machine is actually going to process. So in this case, I have annotated each command, each statement. So each statement ends with its semicolon. And then I've written a brief description of what it's, this line is going to do. So I have commented the code or annotated the code in this way. What I'd like to do is to give you a few minutes, um, some time, to work on a drawing. So there are functions I've introduced here. I'm going to introduce two more. Processing offers not just line and ellipse, but a rectangle can be defined if you know the x, y, the points, the, the point, the location of the upper left and the lower right corner because a rectangle is defined as having um, 90 degree angles, we can define it with those four numbers, the upper left and lower right corner. And the triangle function requires six numbers following it, which are the xy coordinates for each, the first point, the second point, and the third point. I'd also like to introduce a handful of colors so pure red is a maximum on red with no, without any blue, without any green. Green has no red and no blue in it and so forth. I've introduced a couple, few colors here. And if you would like, I've also put a link for an online color picker. So what I would say is to take some time right now and work on a, a drawing, I'll show you where to save it, to work on a drawing with maybe a few shapes, colors that you would like, to, um, that, and to think about it as a drawing that you could do as a collage if I handed out papers or as a painting if I handed out brushes and watercolors. 
a still image with a few shapes. And then when we come back after um, Mark's portion, we'll talk a little further. When I go to file and save, I'm going to do file in this case and save as because it was saved. If you would go to your desktop and go to your My Art folder, give it a name and save it, your drawings will be saved in your My Art folder that you just created. So take a few minutes and have fun feeling like an artist, and we will be circulating. We'll, we'll call you back in a few minutes. And please don't hesitate to ask for help from any of our TAs who are circulating.
let me let me take a look around. All right, sure. Yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> hey, everyone. Sorry, I, I feel terrible because it sounds like you guys are all having a great amount of fun. And I um, see a lot of Kandinsky-like beautiful stuff happening. Yeah, so um, I just want to say, like, isn't Dina Engel the raddest computer programming teacher in the universe? <laughs> Yeah, we're going to do a lot more processing um, uh, going forward, and um, you'll probably do hours of processing, or when you learn to love programming, you'll be tweaking your programs, <laughs> making changes, all, all sorts of things. And so I'm going to show you how to manage those changes. Uh, first, I know you have an awesome program, so let's make sure that we don't lose it. Let's go File, Save As, um, just sort of navigate to desktop my art bank oh so um, again just to, I can click on my home I can click on desktop I can click on my art and if you haven't saved it yet go ahead and save it as something like my cool drawing something like that um, and make sure to save your program, and we're gonna we're gonna track changes on that now. Not as fun as drawing, but I know. But um, so I want to introduce uh, managing your source code, um, and then, so this is the introduction to version control using Git. Uh, what is version control? Uh, version control is a system for managing changes made to documents and other computer files. Uh, what kind of files can we use it with? files that change. And so uh, we're going to be using it with uh, computer source code. As you saw yesterday with Victor and Martina and your, your Glenn, you're using it for documentation. Uh, you can use it for any file that changes. You could track your short stories. You could 
write a book. Track changes on that. Binary files. It's not really meant for binary files like pictures or movies or things like that, but you can check those in as well. Uh, what should we use it for? Text files, projects that have a lot of revisions, changes, and computer source code. I like the source code of writing today and processing. Um, many of us have our own version control systems. Um, I, my resume, um, it's up to this arbitrary number, underscore arbitrary number now. Um, doesn't have a lot of detail, and I keep it in the file name. My memoirs, I was up the other night, and I, at like 3 a.m., and I was like, oh, the rainbow edit, and um, version 3112, and I, I gave that to my editor, and he's like, well, I don't know what it means, and I was like, I don't know either. Actually, that didn't happen, but, um, or, you know, program V1. We don't really know, you know, we, we have these systems, we don't really know what they, um, you know, we, we know what they do, um, others might not, and we might forget. Um, so what, when we're trying to do this uh, mi with mini files, it becomes difficult uh, to manage and error prone. And so software d developers realized this a long time ago and created version control systems for computer source code. Uh, what does it look like? Uh, so here's kind of a, a GUI of a, a, a version controlled software. And this is kind of a complex one. This is actually the processing uh, version control. So here, up here, we have a list of all the changes that have been committed to the source code. Uh, down here we have uh, details of who, what, and when. Uh, so we have an email address and a name here. We have what changed. So this red um, code here is what used to be there. And this green code is how the code has changed or what has been added. And we also have a nice timestamp here that tells us exactly when it happened. So this is a lot better than, you know, just changing the file name. Other people can look at it and get a clear picture. Uh, we get something called a SHA-1 checksum for each change. So this is a unique ID. It, it's, um, it's, a, it's a unique signature, um, uh, that's, uh, and every change has one. We can use that uh, to reference it. We can also use it to check its validity. Um, uh, if, you're, if you're a media conservator, you might check some of your video files to make sure they don't change. Um, and so, and also every change has a descriptive comment. So this says updated the uh, Spanish translation and this was done by Federico Bond at this time. So we'll be doing that. Uh, the processing project, the, you're using processing and it's written in Java, and it's a new language, and a, a higher level language from Java. And um, it has tracked uh, 10,848 changes since its inception in 2001. Now I checked out the source, oh, excuse me, I checked out the source code of processing from the internet, and here it is, and um, so let me scooch this down a little bit. So here's the first commit, initial revision by Ben Fry, and that was in 2001, uh, July 26 at 109.40. And he's just saying, I, I'm just making a place to start uh, processing. And then um, here we have some comments like oops, and like, okay, what was the oops that he did? And then he added bagel, which is, I, so sometimes programmers, you know, they you make good commit messages. Um, but I, this is nice, right? Like, don't need this guy, and then... Um, uh, but then we get some substantial code changes here. So he took a lot of code out of something. Uh, all right, uh, let me find something that's a little more meaningful. So, uh, about to make other changes for the editor for version 0025. And so, um, you know, we're seeing the code change, we're seeing it evolve over, you know, he's adding documentation, he's changing documentation. Now, just to give you context, I checked this out a couple months ago. I can scroll this, you know, wah, like for years. And, um, and I can see, you know, ben, we used to have a lot of commits by Ben Fry, Casey Riaz. But yesterday we were talking about networked version control and processing other contributors added. So we're seeing a lot more contributors later on. And so this tracks the history of the processing project, the evolution of that language, you know, for about 14 years, and I checked this out back in uh, August, um, there's probably a hundred more commits since then. So we have a history of this language, and it all starts with the initial commit, and that's what we're going to do today. Okay. 
Any, any questions? Those are called branches, and I'll talk about it at the end. Like, you can have a repository um, that's, you know, one type of source code, and you can say, I'm going to make a version or a branch that I'm going to work on, sort of like to try some stuff out and not affect this branch, and then I can merge it back. Okay, so what are some use cases of uh, version control for software-based art? And these are theoretical, because it's kind of a, we're, we're, we're introducing this, you know, some may be using version control in the museum now, but languages change, source code uh, needs to be updated and run on current machines. We have security problems, so we might make a branch or, or change the code so it keeps running, maybe in the case of net art. Uh, maybe we want to comment the source code and track that progress with that documentation. We saw some case studies of that yesterday, and, um, and uh, Dina and um, Glenn will be talking about the documentation of source code later today, so maybe we want to track our documentation progress. And also, perhaps artists use version control, and this history give us insight into the history and creation of the work, and is in such of the uh, the processing repository. Uh, these are theoretical. For example, uh, what is Git? It's an open source version control system designed for speed and efficiency. It's the, the current tool, there's been many tools, it's the hipster tool right now. Um, San Francisco, everyone has a Git sticker on the, in their coffee shop laptops. Um, it, it was created by Linus Torvalds in 2005. He's the creator of the Linux operating system, which is what you're using today. Uh, he's an important person in computer history. Um, the name Git, I, I didn't want to put it in there. It just me. it's slang for an unsavory person. Because uh, Linus is like, I wanted something that would reflect me, so I didn't want to <laughs> make that point. But if, you, if anyone asks you, that's what it is. Um, it, it's a good insurance policy against accidental mistakes like deleting work, remembering what was changed uh, by when, why, and whom. And if you use, and your hard drive blowing up. Now, I put an asterisk here. That's if you ex uh, synchronize with an external server. And I'll talk about that um, uh, shortly um, at the end of this presentation. Uh, where you get Git, you don't have to download it, it's on your virtual machine, but if you want to install it on uh, OS X or Windows or your regular laptop, it's at git-scm for sourcecodemanagement.com. It's free. There's an awesome book, um, definitely worth reading. Um, okay, there's a lot of different ways to use Git. We're going to use the command line. There's GUI tools, um, which I'll show you at the end. Okay, so let's fire up the terminal. Don't use this slide, just click here and fire up the terminal. Boom. Sometimes a terminal opens like full screen like this, and so I just want to go here and sort of get it down where I can scooch it around like that and resize it. Sorry, I, don't, I haven't used Linux that much lately. Um, okay, so I'm just going to make that like this, maybe just... Scooch this over here a little bit, just so, so it's nice and like that. Okay, so first we need to set up Git. We need to tell it who we are and how to get a hold of us with our email address. Um, so we're going to type these commands, and we'll type them together in just a second. The first one's git space config dash dash global username and your name. So let's do that together. We're going to type git. Git has a, um, a sub-command or a flag called config. Uh, config takes a parameter, dash dash global. So this means globally across, across the system, wherever we're using git, um, there's going to be a parameter with our name. Uh, let me, okay, git config global. And now we're going to say username user period name, space, and then in quotes, we're going to put our name. So I'm going to put Mark Heller. And now when we check in code, that's going to have our name. Sorry, I know the font's big. We made the font big for teaching, but. So I'm going to type git space config space dash dash global space user period name, quote, my name, quote, and hit return. And it doesn't do anything. Well, it doesn't return anything. It actually did something. 
Okay, so now I'm going to uh, do that again. I'm going to type git config, letting it know I'm going to do a configuration, dash, dash, global, period, user, period, oh, excuse me, user, email, so git space config space dash dash global period email and then in quotes I'm going to put my email address. Oh, is it? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry. Terrible teacher. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Um, sorry. So git d space config space dash dash global space user period email and then in quotes I'm going to put my email mark at hellerstudios.com quote so and we have, we have like the best TAs in New York City so just raise your hand if you need any help <laughs> so um, I have a question yes the first one sets up the username right yeah the Git account yeah Oh, your username is just your, your name. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, do you, uh, thumbs up. Everyone yeah. good? Okay. I see smiles. Are there, well, I don't know if there's smiles as much as when I'm making a digital artwork, but, um, but okay, well, smile, I'll take smiles. Okay, so once we have that entered, we can type git con config dash dash list and that tells us um, some variables that we set our user dot name that's our name and our user dot email um, an email to get a hold of us and so when we commit changes later on that's going to attach our information to things so people say why did you make this change or this feature is amazing well, um, etc. All right, cool. All right, I'm going to move on. Just going to clear my terminal really quick. Okay, so now we're going to create our first repository. So I'm going to just sort of minimize this. Minimize this, get to my desktop here. So I've got my terminal here. And I've got my My Art folder here. So now I'm going to type CD. Remember Ben taught us CD, that means change directory. And I'm going to sort of uh, just find my art folder here. I'm going to drag the, I'm going to hit CD space. Let me, let's see, CD space. And then I'm going to scooch down here and drag my art folder right up onto the terminal and let go. And, and the, yeah, that's a trick. That's like, you know, like, I, yeah, it's it's easier. Um, then I'm just going to hit return, and uh, and I can type PWD print working directory to let me know that I'm in home tech focus desktop my art. Okay, okay. Just call out if you need help. Oh, sorry? Oh, 
Okay. So, is everybody everybody in that directory? Or if not, just raise your hand and we'll get you in that directory. Okay, so once we're once we're in that directory, that's where our source code is. That's where we saved our processing program. And we'll want to tra track changes on that. So I'm just going to type the commands git init. And so this says initialize a directory, initialize a repository. I hit return. And it says, OK, I've emptied initialize an empty Git repository in home, tech focus, desktop, my art. I'm just going to clear the terminal so I can see. So you don't have to do this, but I'm just going to show you that when we initialize Git, when we initialize a repository, it made this hidden folder called .git in the bottom of our directory. That's going to store all of our, it made a copy of our source code, or it will make a copy of our source code. And that's where it's going to keep all the changes to our source code, including the original source code. OK, so. So now I'm going to add all the files in the directory. I'm going to type git space add space period. Uh, period shorthand for everything in the directory. I hit return. It doesn't really give me any feedback, so I can type git period status. And it says, OK, there's a bunch of file uh, changes to be committed. And it shows me my two processing programs. Now, there's also these two process, uh, properties files. Those are metadata files that processing creates um, that are along with your source code. Don't worry about them too much. But this is just saying, these are all the files in this directory, and they're ready to be committed to the repository that we created. Now, um, I've added those files. Now I need to commit them to the repository. Last thing I'm going to do is type git space commit. I now type dash m. That's short for message. And I'm just going to say something like initial commit and do quotes. I hit return. It tells me, OK, I have committed these four files into your repository. Now I can type the command GITK. So that's git with a K at the end. A graphic user interface pops up, and it says, OK, this is your repository. Um, uh, here's your message, your initial commit. It shows that your name and your email address, which you um, configured in the first step, it shows you the files that you created. Um, and those are the initial files you committed. They're green because they're what you've added. And so from here, we can continually commit changes. OK, I know that was nerdy and command line, and there were no color and shapes in. I'm sorry. It's important. And um, as we continue to do this, it'll, it'll, it'll become easier. Um, but you've created your, your first repository. Um, and so I'm going to hand you back to Dina now so you can write some more code. And after that, we'll commit your, your code, uh, your new code, into the repository. Thanks.
know what, Mark? If you could, s just wondering, there's still some people with questions. Oh, yeah, yeah. Do you want to circulate a little bit? So I'm the gentleman with the blue shirt over oh, yeah. there. Just because. Oh, just. I'll be, I'm going to float around, so raise your hand if you have any questions. Yes. I don't know what I'm doing. Oh, okay, sure. When, okay, so once you have to send them up. like to do is to talk some more about processing and then you'll have a chance to do some more artwork and also we'll be able to help you if you have uh, get questions as well. So I'd like to start I'd like to start by talking about what happens with art when there is a new technology. So you all know a great deal more about the history of photography than I do. <laughs> but when I look at very early photographs, what I see are pictures of what somebody otherwise would have painted, like a portrait. And yet, by the next generation, Photographers were experimenting with the chemical baths, they were experimenting with the papers, they were turning their cameras, different angles, and photography as an art form was born. So I'd like us to take a step back and think about software-based art as a new technology. So early software-based art, um, in some ways could look like it might have been done with physical media. But as software art has grown and reached the next generation, I'd like to talk about some of the aspects of software-based art that can no longer be recreated with physical media like pen and ink and paper or oils or watercolors. So some of the areas of software-based art that you are going to come across in your collections, algorithmic art, which could be very regular and repetitive, but would be, if not impossible, certainly extremely difficult to reproduce. Drawings that shift and move, that are drawn, that would not be a still image. And interactive art are just among some of the categories of software-based art where now we are outside of drawings using a digital tool, but that could have been reproduced with physical media in, in the so-called real world. Let's start by looking at iteration, which is repetition in terms of looking at code. So here, for example, I have a drawing which begins with a, a canvas of 400 by 400 and a white background. It's got a line and it has an ellipse. So you've seen this before. But what I am doing is setting up variables for the x and y coordinates and the width 
and the height. So that when I repeat this ellipse command, which it will repeat five times because I can set it up as an iteration, we can begin to see what might happen with algorithmic art. So in this case, it's moving, they're moving to the right because the X is increasing. The Y is decreasing, so they're moving up. And both the width and the height each time is decremented by 20 pixels. So our circles are also getting smaller. So we can start to think about how we want the pieces to be created. Oops, sorry about that. The pieces to be created in, with iteration. Some of the terminology that you'll see in the comments and when we, people talk about software-based art are the programming terms for iteration, which are frequently referred to as for loops and while loops. Those are two ways to build iteration. And condition statements, which use if, for example. If such and such, then we want something to happen. Processing tries to make some of this tries to make some of this a little bit easier for you. Let me just go back into by create by building predefined functions called setup and draw. So I just want to introduce these because it starts to make the code uh, more manageable so we don't have simply a long line of commands, which is okay, but I'd like to group them a little bit. Setup is where, for the next few drawings, I'm going to put the size and the background, or the initial background color for my drawings, and draw will, in fact, manage the repetition for me. So this will do the same thing as we did before. Draw is a function in processing that will continue to draw based on the instructions that we are giving it. Keeping that in mind, we can think about how we might want to work with animation. So we're now really in the realm outside of physical media. Here I have set up a canvas that is four, or a window that is 400 by 400 pixels, and I am going to draw in what color, if this is RGB, what color am I gonna draw in? I'll be drawing in, in blue with a background of white. So what I want to do is to draw so that the drawing will continue. And when it gets to the bottom, I've got a test in my code that says if the variable for i is greater than 400, I reset it to zero. Because I'm drawing a horizontal line. And that line starts at 0, 0, and it goes to 400, 0. But as that number increments, my line will move down. So now we are out of the realm that we could reproduce this with physical media. That would not be possible. We're now in digital art. Yes? Ah, very good question. So there are a number of ways of working with speed, but some of it has to do with the increment. If I only were to increment by one pixel, for example, so I say i equals i plus one, and by the way, computer scientists and mathematicians greatly disagree about how to use the equal sign. What it means in programming is that you take everything that's on the right, figure it out, throw it into the left. So, because mathematicians look at this stuff and their hair turns gray. But in any case, if I now run the drawing, it's incrementing by one pixel. So it's subtly a little bit slower. On the other hand, what if I were to increment by 10 pixels? 
and to run it. It appears to go much faster. So there are other ways to play with speed as well, but the increment in how we move the line is all part of how we want to do, how you want to conceive of your drawing. Another thing that I could do would be to set the background in the setup, which isn't going to change anything right now. I am going to put the increment back to two because I'd like you to see. So when I run it, we have this, this is the pace that I like. So you guys all will make your own drawings. That's the pace I like. But what happens if, in fact, I decide not to reproduce the background each time? I would call this a line now of unused code. So now if I run this, we have a completely different drawing. And by the way, those variations are a happy accident. On my screen, the blue, is, the blue lines are exactly the same color each time. But it, to me, stuff like this when it happens is almost like when I take a sponge and do it, a, run it over a watercolor. Uh, if it's still wet, I may get some very interesting effects. So that, the fact that those blues are varied is an anomaly based on this projection. It's not part of the drawing. One of the things for you to bear in mind if you're a curator or a conservator. Okay, so here we have an animated drawing. And there are lots of things that you could think about with this drawing. You could change the color of the line. You could have it go vertically instead of horizontally. You could change its direction by starting at the bottom and then decrementing the y value and have it move up. You can have the line go all the way across or part way. And you can also think about the fact that the way it's running right now, the line does not stop moving. So that if I put this line, if I put the background back and say, oh, wait a minute, I think I like it like this, it's quite clear that, in fact, the line will continuously move. But, in fact, if we don't keep putting back the background, then it'll appear different. So this is, is it's a medium, and I like it this way. I'm going to leave it this way. That's how I want it to look. I've annotated this for you. Again, everything that follows the slashes our comments. But I'd also like to talk about interactive images, which is now way off the scale of what happens with works of art in physical media, what I call physical media. So processing offers a number of functions for interacting with the user. Mouse X and mouse Y, for example, will give you the x and the y coordinates of where the user has the mouse at that moment. Mouse pressed will tell you whether the mouse is pressed. So if, for example, I open this drawing, I have a setup with 400 by 400 pixels, which is arbitrary. I just thought that would work with this screen. I have a white background, and I've gone back to my magenta fill. There are even amounts of red and blue, and there's no green here. And I've told the drawing program to put a circle, and we know it's a circle because the height and the width are equal wherever the user has put the mouse. So if I run this, watch. You can't see my hand, but in fact, I'm using the mouse. All right. And even further than that, I thought you might enjoy, what if I not only follow the user's mouse, but I follow whether or not they're clicking the mouse. Well, if they're clicking the mouse, I want to make it magenta. But if they're not clicking the mouse, what color is it here? There's no red, there's no green, pure blue. 
So if I run this sketch, I'm getting the blue circle, but as soon as I, you can't see, but as soon as I hold the mouse down, I've got the purple. So now I've got an interactive work of art, which is beyond something that we could conceive of with oil paints. So we're now in a new medium. And this is where software art is, software-based art is taking off. Before I um, give you time to go back to your drawing, because what we'd like you to do is to go back to your drawing and to make it mouseable, if that's a word, or to animate it in some way, but to do something with your drawing that you could not do if I asked you to reproduce it with watercolors. Um, before I stop, so that you can work on your drawing, I just want to point out, for those of you who are interested, that the last few slides have, um, I've listed some tutorials and exhibitions on the processing site. I've listed um, some exhibitions outside of the site that also, um, the first one, Open Processing, gives, lots, gives the source code and links for processing in several languages. So that if anybody is interested, um, you can download processing. It just takes a moment or two. At some other point, you don't have to open up VirtualBox. You could put processing on your machine. So I just wanted you to see that, that those resources are there. Oh, I forgot, and at the very end, of course, is my email. So everybody always knows where to find me if you have any questions. So what I'd like to do is to render your earlier drawing in some novel way so that you continue to feel the experience of being a digital artist, a software artist. And then Mark will come back and you get to commit your changes so that you'll also see the version control.
Hello. Um, I can see that you're all really into this. Um, but I just wanted to say that we do have a coffee break now for half an hour. So feel free to stay here and keep working, make those drawings really amazing. Um, we'll come back at 11.35. And what we're going to shift the schedule a little bit. When you come back, Mark will be with you for about 10 or 15 minutes so you can commit these drawings to Git. And then Ben will start on... Uh, disk imaging. So if we're back ready to go at 11.35, that would be great. Thank you. May I have your attention? Before we continue, I would just like to say I've seen some really cool drawings, some wonderful sketches happening. So I just want to point you to there's a site called openprocessing.org. You may want to start up a free account and post your work. And then you can send people the URL, and you will have a work of art online. Your, so much of your work is beautiful. I just couldn't resist. OK, I'm going to turn over the floor to Mark. OK, well, I see some amazing drawings yeah. and animations. I'm staring at one right now that's like, wow, that's gorgeous. That's gorgeous. Um, so, so you'll want to you'll wanna track the changes to your drawings. Um, and so I'm just going to talk about tracking changes. Uh, we, we were ambitious. Uh, we have a lot in here, so I'm going to kind of rush through this uh, conceptually. We're not rush through it, but go a bit uh, paced. Yes. So tracking changes. So here's sort of the conceptual workflow of how we track changes. So we edit, add, or delete files. We add a, a file in processing, we, our processing program. We change it or we delete it. Then we stage those changes to a staging area. Uh, we can review those changes, and then finally, we can commit them to the repository. Um, so if we have a processing program in here, I've got this using functions. So I'm going to file save as. Um, to get to my directory, my art directory, I'm going to just click on the home directory. I'll go to desktop and then my art. Uh, I've added this new one, so new underscore drawing. Save it. Save. I'll minimize this, uh, minimize that. Minimize a couple things and then make sure I have a terminal up. I can always click here to get a new terminal. I'll want to change directory to my art. That's where my repository is. And I go in there. And um, I'm where the repository is. Now, this is a good command, git space status. And so git's always looking at your directory where the repository is. And it's like, hey, there's a new file added, or a file's been edited and changed. Um, so it tells me, it's like, oh, you got some new stuff. And it tells me, use git add to track this file. So I'm going to type git add period. Period adds all the changes. I could put, say, a specific file. I tend to just use period so I can just add all the files and changes. I hit return. Oh, I, I made a typo. Uh, sorry. G-I-T add period. So git space add space period. Adds all the files and changes. All right. So now if I say, let me just scooch this out. Now if I type git status, OK, these are, it tells me these files have been committed to a staging area, and they're in green. What does that mean? 
So when we have, uh, in Git, there's like three conceptual areas. There's the working directory. It's where we're saving our files. In this case, it's my art. There's this index, which is known as a staging area. And when we type git add, it takes all the changes or new files and stages this in the index. Now, when I use the command git commit, it commits those files to the repository. So we can put places in the staging area, and we can review them and things like that, and then we can finally commit them. So I hit git add, and it says, these files are in the staging area, and they're ready to be committed. So now I can type git commit. Uh, dash m is short for message. We want a nice message. You saw in processing there were some fun messages like dough or, you know, like adding some junk or something. You kind of don't want to do that because other people are going to read it. You know, maybe, uh, you know, I was working on an artwork and, you know, the Smithsonian acquired it and they're looking through and they're like, look at his commit messages. Um, so I'm going to say um, changed color on circle. You don't have to be that, that verbose. It's just, it's meaningful. And when we're collaborating with others, you know, you want to give a meaningful message. So I hit return. It now says these have been committed to the repository. Two files have changed 25 insertions. I can now uh, type git k. Git k is just a, a visual um, a GUI. It, rep it shows us our changes on our repository. I hit that. Okay, so here, I, it's like, okay, I had my initial commit. This is my master repository. I had my initial commit, and this is what we did the first thing. We committed uh, all our stuff initially. And then up here, I have a new date stamp, and this was committed by me, a, a new checksum, a new ID. And it says, okay, you've added some new files. I added my new drawing to this repository. And so in my case, I added a new file. Let me let me go back and uh, file open. I'm going to go into my art. Just an example. You don't have to do this. I'm going to go to new drawing. I'm going to change the stroke color to a uh, stroke to like 10, and I'm going to make the fill 150. I may make a comment like you know, forward slash forward slash changing. Uh, Stroke. I'm going to go file, save. I'm going to save that. Uh, I go back to my command line. Well, I hit control C twice to close that. Um, and then I say get status. It's like, oh, your new drawing has changed. And I'm like, okay, cool. So again, all uh, the workflows get add. I stage those changes. I can again look, cite git status to say, okay, these are in this uh, staging area. And I'll, I'll com commit it again and then say, uh, changed stroke. And so it's committed that. So now if I look at this, I have another commit. So initial commit here. I added this, my message, well, I actually added a new file, and it shows the new code I added. And then here I changed the stroke. So it's like, okay, it used to say stroke fill. Those, got, those have changed to, I added a comment. I changed the stroke from the previous version from 0 to 10, and I changed the fill color. I added a uh, green value of 150 there. And that's, that's basically the workflow. You, uh, you initialize a repository. You check in the files and you commit them. And so this takes some practice, um, but really there's only a few commands um, that you have to practice. And this is really, I want you to understand how it works conceptually. Um, I, I wanted to talk about branches for a little short on time, but uh, know that there's a branch command. And so you can make branches of code, uh, make different versions of code. So definitely look that up. Um, there's some great tutorial guides um, in the handout, and so branches are cool.
Um, Git and GitHub, you can connect Git to GitHub. You can publish your code on the web. Here's a great article here, help.github.com, about how to get set up to push your code to the web and look at others, check in uh, other people's code. I grabbed the processing code from GitHub. It's kind of like Facebook for nerds or something, Facebook for programmers. Um, uh, there's some further learning here. Uh, try github.io and there's some challenges. You can do it all in the browser too. Um, there's GUI versions. Source, source tree um, is great. And there, a GitHub has a desktop. So you'll understand this all conceptually, but there's graphic user versions as well. And there's books and things like that, tutorials. So um, this was just an introduction. Take it further. Um, thank you. I'm leaving now.